my book starts from the Big Bang <laughs> and it comes to right now. So obviously some of the details have to be la left out because I'm covering 15 billion years. Uh, but my thesis is that history is something that you can, you can decipher if you see it as the story of the tug of war between two human impulses. And one impulse is to reach out across borders and try to connect with other people who are not like ourselves. And the other impulse is to close ranks with our own kind against the other and form tighter bonds with our own. So these are opposite tendencies and I think all through history we've been doing both. So history has been generated by that tug of war. And then I think, you know, when you, when you come in close, what you find is that there's three things that are always involved. One is the environment. You know, we're trying to cope with wherever we are. One are tools, because that makes a difference all through history, whatever we're using. But the third thing, which is the most important thing right, right now, is our narratives. We're all living in some story of the world, and we have different stories. And so um, what we see all over the world is a failure to understand one another because we're not living in the same world, because we're not living in the same story. How your personal background shaped your view and the way that you looked at the history of humankind at all? Well, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's very pertinent, actually, because I think that if you grow up bicultural, like I did, if you grew up in two different worlds. My experience was when I went, when I was in an Afghan setting, I was Afghan. And when I moved over and I was in an American setting, I was an American. And these were two different things. And I could even see myself changing as I moved from one setting to the other. And it wasn't just me changing, it was the world changing. Uh, so what that uh, produces is a sense of, uh, how relative everything is. The extent to which what we think is real is actually only the, the narrative we share with everyone who agrees with us. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, that's, the plat that's the starting point for me. Very interesting. And, and uh, so overall, I mean, this is a very heavy topic that you're working on and, and it's huge, has so many things in it. Uh, but overall, Mr. Ansari, are you optimistic in terms of uh, human beings' uh, achievements through the history, through the years in terms of violence and having a better understanding of each other and overall, do you think that human beings made a lot of progress or not? Um, I think they have and they haven't. Uh, you know, I think uh, some of the stories that we live with in the world aren't about progress. Our story here mostly is about progress. We have this belief that each day is and should be better than the day before, and we want to go into the new and the different. But you know, in a lot of ways, in the Islamic world, the impulse hasn't been on into the new. It's the perfect moment already happened. We have to restore it. We have to get back to that. We have to find out what was great about that and be there. I'm not saying I I have an opinion about which one is true or which one is false. I'm just saying there are different stories. What I do see is that all through history, people have overlapped and they have been, you know, culturally at odds with one another. And there's been friction and there's been, you know, misunderstanding, there's been fighting. But over time, if they keep interacting, they build a bigger story they share. And right now, we're in a world in which everybody's bumping into everybody, you know, Indians, Chinese, Americans, you know, Africans, m Muslims. You, you're bumping elbows against people in the same space who are living in different stories. Over time, those are going to mix and there will be a bigger story that will include all of us. There's no quick way to get there. There's only, you know, going through all the heartache, all the friction, all the argument, but always, you know, the, the, the road of progress is to, try, is to try to see how to rise above our separate stories to see what a bigger story is that we share. Interesting. How did you find uh, religion's uh, roles in terms of, of, of conflicts and violence? So especially nowadays, uh, well, 
uh, Islam and what's going on in the Middle East in terms of war and conflict is a hot topic and people uh, think about it and it's very important and, and it affects people's pe millions of people's life every day. Do you think Islam provides uh, a narrative to encourage violence? Um, I'm not quite ready to say Islam encourages violence, uh, partly because you know, the first question to raise is, well, what is Islam and who gets to say what Islam is? Uh, there are definitely people in the world who are saying, this is Islam and this leads us to, you know, this, this makes it uh, that God's command is for you to be a soldier. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily what Islam says. And I think it's completely possible to be a different kind of Muslim and say, let's see now. Islam says you, you say namaz. You, uh, you fast in, in solidarity with the poor. You give a portion of your income to, uh, you know, to, 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 to charity. Um, you go to Mecca once a, uh, once a lifetime if you can or, or more. Uh, and uh, you make the testament of faith. Only one God and Muhammad is prophet. I say that when you say there's only one God, what you're really saying is finally there is one truth that we all belong to. Uh, I say that at some level, if the thing you believe is we should be fighting somebody else, you're not on to the one God thing. You're saying our God is better than their God. That's somehow, a, you know, that's a lower, lower way of thinking to me. So in, in your opinion, what is the main reason or what are the, the main reasons of, of conflicts in the Middle East now? Or the war that has been going on for years in Afghanistan? Um, well, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of the different reasons, and, and it goes back, it has roots in history. Uh, and part of the roots is, you know, we're still living in the after effects of the huge expansion of the Western world uh, in terms of its colonization of all other parts of the world and the imperialism, you know, that we saw in the 18th, 19th century and into the 20th. So that's part of it. Uh, I think there's something else going on here too. I think that there's, um, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're messing with the planet. We're uh, possibly threatening life on Earth with uh, the effect we're having on the environment. Um, some of the effects of that, you know, in Afghanistan, water is a problem. That's an environmental problem. And it's not solved by uh, digging deep wells and getting the groundwater deeper down because that takes away water that takes eons to develop. So there's a problem there. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there, there has been uh, famine and starvation in, in uh, you know, parts of Africa and other parts of the world. And I think a lot of people are scared. They're not sure that there's going to be enough for everyone. This is where these narrative things c come in. Because if you're afraid that there's not enough for everyone, you start looking around to see who you're going to share with when the food runs out and who you're not going to share with. And I think fear leads people to, to start doing that. Um, at the same time, one of the things that's happening is, you know, our technology is building machines that are replacing humans. Everybody, at some level, I think everybody is anxious about that. And so then people are looking around saying, uh, is this the end? <laughs> you know? And when you're afraid, then things happen. And I think that's, that's a large part of it. So th that's very powerful because in Afghanistan, I've, I've seen and I've, 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 uh, people have told me over and over that now many people from the villages in Afghanistan, from the remote villages, this, they, they moved out because there is no enough water. Yeah. So it happens in a country that already involved deeply in a deadly war. Yeah. And, and, and what do you think, where is, where is the future for that country that you, you lived a portion of your life in? Well, um, you know, I do have a sort of optimism. And, and my sort of optimism is that actually things can change sort of in the blink of an eye. And, and that's one of the things I think about, about religious moments in history. You know, uh, something like the birth of Islam was a sudden and huge event. Ten years before, nobody would have been able to guess that this thing is going to happen. Uh, 
after the uh, the the prophetic career of uh, Hazrat Muhammad, which was less than 20 years. You know, it's like if you think in terms of how many presidential terms that is, it's like two presidents worth or something. Um, so it was a very short time, and then within a hundred years, there was a world civilization that had that had emerged from this little thing. Uh, I think the same can be said for many of the of the the birth of many of the great religions. Um, and so, you know, what you see is that you have a, a world that feels meaningless and there's a lot of chaos and co somebody comes in and drops a little stone and it has ripple effects and all of a sudden the world makes sense in a, in a new way to vast numbers of people. You can't see that coming beforehand. We're in a moment of chaos and, and, and incoherence. I think that much I can say for, for sure. I think we always feel like the present moment is the most real thing. <laughs> and always our sense of history is, how did it get to the present moment, which is finally where it's always gonna be? I know the present moment is always changing. <laughs> so that can't be the real. <laughs> Something that's always changing can't be the permanent. Uh, and how is it gonna be five years from now, 10 years from now? I don't know. Uh, all I can say is we have to imagine what kind of a world we should be living in and try to communicate what we see as, a, as an imaginary perfect world. And when we all believe that that's possible, it will be the case. <laughs> How Afghan culture, Afghan music, Afghan food, uh, shaped your life and how involved are you with uh, Afghan music, Afghan uh, food, Afghan clothes perhaps and other aspects of Afghan culture overall? Uh, Afghan clothes did you say? <laughs> 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 I have a few pirona tombons in that in the house. <laughs> I don't really ever wear them. Uh, you, you know you have it huh? I have a few Do yeah. You have lungi as well? I don't have a lungi. I should probably, I don't know how to put on a lungi, you know, I'm not good at that. Uh, you know, I cook Afghan food. I love to cook. Uh, I go, I have some relatives in Fremont. I, I see them from time to time. Uh, you know, I, I, I never speak Farsi unless I'm over there with those guys. And I will have to say that when, uh, you know, I came before all that. I came in 64 before the, the Holocaust in Afghanistan. And it used to be that when we got together, everybody was speaking Farsi. Increasingly over these years, you know, people just are speaking in English more. So that's one of the things that happens in the course of living in another <clears throat> another country. Um, I, um, you know, music? Ahmad Zoyer is the only <laughs> is the only Afghan music I listen to. Uh, I have him on my uh, iPhone. Uh, I have a I have really good Ahmad Zoyer. You know, um, uh, his tapes were pirated and pirated, and and so in stores, Afghan stores, you find CDs of Ahmad Zoyer. Often they're very low quality, so I'm proud to say I have a really good <laughs> collection of. Where did you get that? Uh, Sorry. Well, you know Ahmad Zoyer, uh, uh, we sort of knew him. Uh, he was uh, uh, the nephew of my uh, father's best friend. So, uh, you know, so in those days, cassettes and stuff were shared amongst people. So we had original, <laughs> you know, fresh off the, uh, uh, off the, uh, uh, the, not the concert, you know, sitting in a house with a bunch of people uh, yeah. like that. Let me ask you another question. Uh, do you so how you are dealing with identity? Are you an Afghan and American? Are you an American? Are you so like? Can you explain that? Well, I'm an American, and when I uh, when I first came to America, I was an Afghan, and when I was in Afghanistan, I was an American, uh, because my mother was American, and and there was no other Americans there, just me and my uh, my siblings. But in Afghanistan in those days, because of that, when I was outside the house, you know, people saw me and they said, there's that American kid. So I thought I was an American kid. When I came here, I was like, oh, finally I'm going to be where my people are. 
No, I hear everybody say, hey, there's that Afghan kid. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, people have asked me uh, how you sort out, you know, how you become one thing or another thing and what, how you embrace what your identity is. And I, I think for me, you know, and I think for a lot of people in my position, uh, you look at all the ways you don't fit and all the times you don't fit and you add them up and that's who you are. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm content with that. I, I'm fine with that. Very interesting. And, and recently you went to Kabul. And how did you find Kabul and your, your hometown perhaps or your, your uh, neighborhood that you lived in for, for a while in your childhood? Yeah, I haven't lived there in a long time. And really, you know, uh, I had two times that I went uh, in, since 9-11. And uh, both times were very, very interesting. And the first time, just after the, uh, the fall of the Taliban, um, you know, it was one of the highlights of my life, going back to, to Kabul. Uh, I just thought I was going to go to a place from which I would feel very alienated. And instead, I went to a place that just felt so warm. And I experienced there a spirit and a way of life and an attitude about time and life and, you know, just nature and all that stuff um, that I guess is in me, you know. I, 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 it's, it's one of those things that when you're in the stew, suddenly you see that you have that. So I really enjoyed that. The second time I went back, it's a busy place where kind of everybody's on the make. You know, a trillion dollars dropped on the place and it's trying to find itself. So I wasn't as, as engaged. At the same time, I thought it was really interesting and exciting to see all the different things people were doing. <laughs> you know, my relatives, uh, for one, what was happening in, in the village we came from. So very interesting. Is there any particular story or moment that bothers you a lot about Afghanistan or it strikes you the most and you, you know, makes you think about it unconsciously sometimes or consciously? Um, I don't know if there's a moment that bothers me the most. Uh, you know, I've been so up and down and through so many phases in my relationship to Afghanistan. I remember um, you know, back in the days when uh, the communists were in power there and the war was being fought in the countryside and I was here, you know, and my father was there and my family was scattered all over the place. And I often had these dreams where I was on a plane and then it had to make an unscheduled stop in Kabul. <laughs> and, and I was, and they were nightmares. Uh, but they were also sort of like, I'd get out of the plane and I'd go to this garden and I was scared and I'd be looking everywhere. So that was an era. Later, when the Taliban uh, had taken over, you know, the Mujahideen War and then the Taliban, I thought, I assumed, I think most of the few people, you know, the Afghans I knew, we would never see Afghanistan again. We thought that was the end of it and that's how things are going to be now forevermore. But then in 2002, there I was, you know, it's different again. Um, so... Uh, so, you know, it's, um, the, the one thing that I, I want to, uh, comment on, you know, there is a, uh, there is a concept called the anthropological present about other cultures, which is what the culture really is, is whatever it was when anthropologists first started studying it. And actually every culture is always alive it's always growing afghanistan is alive and growing um you know i i have thought and i i still kind of think that if only everybody would leave afghanistan alone afghanistan would be fine um, but i also realize that everybody won't leave afghanistan alone it's just right in that spot where people can't help themselves you know the big powers just they just go in so um. If you count them, it's a story of why I went to Kabul. 
Okay, well, this project is uh, part of my memoir workshop, memoir writing workshop. Mm -hmm. And I uh, have up to five people, uh, not more, come to my house once a week. Uh, they've written stories about their lives or what they're doing, and then we discuss it and we, uh, we improve the writing if we can. So Asma John is somebody I knew from before, and, and she told me that she wanted to write a book about something she'd been doing since 9-11, which was going to Afghanistan every year, uh, buying bare root trees, little trees, in a nursery, and taking them out to villages or to neighborhoods of Kabul, and just giving them to people. And hopefully they would uh, plant them, and if next year the trees are doing well, she comes back, she gives them more. So she was going there every year and doing this, and she wanted to write a book about it, and she wanted me to help her. I said, come to my workshop. So, okay, great. Uh, you know, she did, and that's a good thing, because then it's not just me saying, oh, write it like this, write it like that. There's other people, so we see how it's, you know, is everybody hearing it? Mm. <laughs> you know, people have different ears, so that's what's good about a workshop. As you mentioned in our previous conversation, uh, especially kids, uh, Afghan kids who grew up in the United States, who yeah. were born perhaps here in the United States, and you mentioned that some of them are struggling uh, sort of with uh, identity crisis somehow. They're finding who they are. So please explain about that and how you uh, work with them and, and what was the result of, of, of some of your work. Well, it's not always crisis. It's, it's a hidden drama. You know, uh, the kids that, are, that were born here or grew up here... Uh, they live in a sort of an Afghan environment when they go home. It's not really Afghanistan because it can't be, you know, you can't just start a new thing. But they do live in an Afghan environment when they go home and then they leave the house and they go to school or elsewhere. Then they're living in an American environment and they're caught between these two worlds. Uh, so I think that's a, uh, that's a story. And uh, not only is it a story, but it's a story that's happening right now and uh, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, it'll be lost and nobody will know what ever happened mm -hmm. unless the people who are going through it write about it right now. So uh, I started working with uh, some, you, you say kids, they were young adults, you know, mm -hmm. at this point, uh, uh, people who came here when they were two or born here or something, they were 20, 25 years old. Um, very wide variety of, of people, wide variety of experiences. Uh, and I was fortunate to have a, um, uh, a woman named Yaldo Asmati got involved with the project. She was really good. She uh, went out and got, um, you know, got pieces and, mm -hmm. and we worked on these. I thought it was a great project. And, you know, later all of those young people that wrote in this uh, in this book snapshots that I mm. published of their works mm. uh, they've all gone on to do interesting things some are in politics some are in the arts some are in different you know. great all right well you know um, I think that uh, it isn't just a case of immigrants uh, becoming part of American culture because American culture itself is not just this static thing that's always been like that and it's always going to be that you just have to join it or not join it. American culture itself is something that has grown and developed because of immigrants who keep coming in. And you know what we don't often realize is that things we consider to be just as American as, as, as can be, mm -hmm. as American as potato salad mm -hmm. or hamburgers or hot dogs or the Christmas tree, uh, those were brought here by immigrants. We don't realize that, you know, for example, hot dogs was something that German immigrants brought here. And when they first came, they were considered, uh, you know, oh, keep the Germans out, they're going to pollute and so on. Um, and um, pretty much everybody in America is an immigrant except the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And even they, you know, their ancestors came here at some point. So uh, I think that the... the the thing that has to happen, and you know, there are some political barriers to it now, but but I think in a healthy society, immigrants come in and they 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 absorb some of what's there, and they impart some of what they have into that that uh, that brew that that soup, mm -hmm. uh, and 
whatever American culture is, it changes, it, it, it grows, it gets, it gets richer and better from all these different flavors coming in. So I hope we can continue to uh, work out the political uh, you know, mechanisms that will allow immigration to be part of <laughs> you know, what the American nice. experience is, both for the people who are already here and for the people who are coming. Great, thank you so much. And uh, uh, Asmajan, can you explain uh, uh, about your project? And, and can you mention, obviously, one particular story that you know it strikes you the most about this project that you worked, went to Afghanistan, talked to people, uh, and, and now you're in San Francisco. Share one, 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 particular, one story. particular story. Especially this past uh, March, I was in Kabul for two weeks, planting trees. Uh, in uh, 2012, no, 2013, sorry, I met a nomads. These are people who live outside 40 miles north of Kabul. And I met them and they were just homesteading in this area without getting a specific, uh, uh, what do you call it, permits to build their homes in this area. And it's, it's east of Parwan area. Mm -hmm. And but I went in anyhow because they were not under refugee UNPD refugee nor in Tunis nothing they just homestead, and I said we let's go see these people see what they're doing, and they and we shook our hand and we said, couple very tall beautiful Pashtun speaking they didn't speak in Farsi they spoke Pashtun, uh, Pashto and I speak Farsi but my trans my man that works in Najib City he speaks Pashto and he helped me. And I says, you know, you're moving over here, and that's fine. What can I do for you? Mm. And the, his uh, problem was great, but I couldn't do that. I says, I can help you, give you trees. And he goes, you can give me trees. I'll take it, but I will also like to have some water for those trees. And I says, definitely. Well, we'll help you with water, so what shall we do? You know? So we helped him with water, so the tanks, you know, the blue tanks right. will come in and bring some water. And, uh, and then there was not too far away from his area where his homestead um, in a um, natural uh, brook. Mm -hmm. So we helped him bring pipes to his village. He had about 200 nomads living with him. Mm -hmm. I gave him trees. That was 2013. 2014 I saw him and we started talking about it. 2015, 2016 he says to me, would you like to meet my wife? Mm -hmm. I was very honored. Because these people are very, 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 very uh, close and private. They don't allow anyone to come in, and especially someone who doesn't even speak the same language. So I had the honor to meet them and his wife and his children and the family. And then past year, the story going forward, he, I walk in to bring his trees. He comes in from his house, and with him was a man from the uh, government. I can't mm. tell you whether he was the mayor of the ta area or, what, or governor, but he was there and he came with his, uh, his bodyguards and his gold watch and some other uh, Afghan men and mm. uh, uh, trucks mm. with guns. And he looked at me and I looked at him and I went, say, Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> I called him Wazijan. I said, Assalamu alaikum Wazijan. For me, who was the tourist? And I said, how are you? How's the family and everything? And the man that who was supposed to be high official, he looked at me and he was not sure how to react. react. And then the nomad that I call Wazir, he goes, please go visit my wife. I'll be with you in a minute. So that is telling me that how much this relationship of going every year and every year and every year that is connects us together. It doesn't happen. Just because I'm Afghan or I'm whatever, I'm being treated, now doesn't mean I'm going to open. All doors are open. Because sometimes it's all superficial, but this is not superficial, as you can tell. And the other thing I joke with him, I said, so what has this man brought for you? He goes, he didn't bring me anything. He just wanted to eat my uh, uh, yogurt. Mm. You're the one who brought me apricots. Yeah. And that's when he told me that the apricots trees were flourishing past two years. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Mr. Ansari, thank you so much. Yeah, thank Thanks. you.
I spent my first 16 years in Afghanistan. I was born there, I was raised there. So Afghanistan is my childhood. And like every childhood, it had its ups and downs. Uh, I remember though, you know, uh, uh, when I was 15, I got a scholarship to come to America to spend my last two years in high school here. And uh, towards the end of that year, I went to my uncle's house and my father and my uncles were sitting around and playing karambort, which is sort of like a tabletop pool with discs instead of balls. And it was such a uh, uh, kind of a peaceful scene. And uh, um, I was excited about coming to America. I didn't know there was going to be an after Afghanistan. I didn't know what was going to happen in the future. But I remember my father telling me, uh, Bachim, when you go there, you know, get your education and, uh, you know, learn, learn what you need to learn. And then come back to Afghanistan because out there, there's going to be war, there's going to be conflict, there's going to be all these bad things. But here in Afghanistan, in the mountains here, uh, none of that stuff is ever going to reach Afghanistan. All there's ever going to be is uh, if uh, there's a loud noise, it'll be a donkey in the next yard. Uh, hawing. So I often remember that later when Afghanistan entered into the Holocaust because you never know what's coming and uh, it's a poignant memory and it was in 1964 which was one of the best times for Afghan history so I remember that. <laughs>